Hi, everyone, and welcome to another meeting of the MIT Spark Lab. Um, today, I'm very excited to have a presentation from our own Hank Yang. And uh, Hank is a PhD candidate uh, in, uh, in uh, Spark, has been working uh, in the group for the last, um, for more than two years now, for around two years now. And um, today, he's going to talk about certified robust geometric perception. Take it away, Hank. Okay, uh, thanks Luca for the introduction. So yeah, today uh, my talk will be on certifiably robust geometric perception with outliers from teaser uh, to beyond. And this is joint work with uh, Luca, Jinnan, Pospa, and Vasilis uh, from the Spark Lab. So first of all, what is uh, geometric perception? So although there is no clear definition of geometric perception, but from my point of view, geometric perception is a task of estimating geometric models from visual measurements. For example, the model can be 3D poses and 3D structure, and the visual measurements can be image and point clouds. Geometric perception spans uh, a whole spectrum of problems. For example, it can be pose estimation, it can be localization and mapping, it can also be object detection and 3D reconstruction. Geometric perce perception also has uh, an extensive uh, applications in uh, robotics and computer vision. For example, it can, can be autonomous driving, it can be robotic manipulation, it can be autonomous flight, can also be robotic search and rescue. So where do we stand now in, uh, in designing algorithms for geometric perception? So out, over the last few decades, uh, the community has made tremendous progress in solving geometric perception. And one of the breakthroughs is, is that uh, an increasing number of so-called non-minimal solvers are being discovered, typically based on convex, semi-definite, and sum of squares relaxations. So the distinguishing feature of Non-minimal solver is that it not only solves the problem, but also it provides a certificate for global optimality. I'll show you three examples. So the first example is mesh registration. In this example, we're given a, a clean 3D mesh and a noisy point cloud, point cloud observation of the 3D mesh. Suppose that we have correct data association, basically correspondences from the mesh to the point cloud. Then the SCB solver that's proposed by Borealis a few years ago can actually compute the global, globally optimal alignment from the mesh to the point cloud. The second example is called shape alignment. In this example, we are, we are still given a clean 3D mesh, but now the, the visual measurements is actually a 2D image of the 3D mesh. And in this case, we can, also, uh, we can also assume all the correspondences from the mesh to the 2D image are actually correct. Then the SOS solver that we propose in this year's ECRA can actually compute the globally optimal camera pose. The third example is related to SLAM. This problem is called pose graph optimization, and it consists in finding the globally optimal pose graph by uh, given the noisy uh, measurements from odometry and loop closures. In this, uh, in this example, the seminar work by uh, called SE Sync can actually compute the globally optimal uh, uh, pose graph very quickly, actually. And then these non-minimal these, these non solvers are usually designed uh, in the sense of least squares estimation. So therefore, they are not designed to be aware of outliers or to be robust to outliers. For example, if we just spoil a few incorrect correspondences to these problems shown by these uh, red lines, then these non-minimal solvers will actually struggle to output uh, the correct uh, and accurate estimate of the poses or the global, po uh, global pose graph, for example, uh, the, the images I show here, uh, the, the estimations output by these, by these nominal solvers are actually far away from the ground truth. So, you know, this is not the end of the story because actually in computer vision and robotics, we have a systematic uh, tool set of outlier robust estimation tools that can actually uh, robustify these nominal solvers and regain robustness to outliers. For example, the most classical uh, uh, method to use is called RANSAC. It randomly samples uh, these correspondences until it reaches uh, a consensus set. And more recently uh, in our group, we proposed ADAPT, which stands for Adaptive train, uh, Trimming, and GNC, which stands for Gradual and Non-Convexity, that, that, that can actually act as a general purpose framework to robustify these nominal solvers. To give you an example, if we use GNC, for example, uh, to, together with the nominal solvers that, that I introduced in the previous slide, then we can actually regain robustness to outliers. We can, we can be robust to, for example, more than 70% of the uh, outlier correspondences. And then as shown by these images, the, uh, the estimates that's 
uh, in this case are actually very close to the ground truth. So now the question is, uh, you know, is this the end of the story? Does this mean that robust estimation is solved? That, you know, we can just uh, relax and, you know, give up research? From my point of view, I think, you know, the answer is definitely no, because uh, from my point of view, the real demon is actually hiding be behind the, uh, the good performances of these robust estimation frameworks. And the fundamental limitation uh, of these uh, robust estimation frameworks is, is actually that they actually fail uh, without notice. Uh, so these algorithms are not designed to be aware of their own failures. So first of all, these algorithms do, these algorithm, algorithms do fail. So let's take a look at the uh, typical uh, failure rate uh, plot for GNC, for example. You can see that GNC actually performs quite well when the uh, outlier rate is below 80%. You know, it almost always gives you the correct answer. But once the outlier rate grows above 80%, then you see these uh, non-zero failure rates. Uh, similarly for RANSAC, the failure rate also grows once the outlier rate grows. It also performs relatively well under 80% uh, outlier rate, but then for 90%, for example, it starts failing uh, quite often. So the, the question is, do these failures or do these occasional failures really matter for our applications? So I think you know this is uh, this is there is a, there are two answers for this. So the first answer is in most applications we probably do not care about these occasional failures. For example, in you know entertainment applications such as VR or AR, these uh, these fail random failures will basically just transfer to random glitches in the in the in the in the virtual experience of the user, which don't necessarily matter too much. But actually, on the other hand, if you want to apply these uh, robust estimation frameworks or, or algorithms to serious applications such as autonomous driving or space robotics, then these local minima are really going to hurt us. So for example, uh, if we use uh, uh, GNC to solve uh, shape alignment or space robot uh, for or like uh, uh, pose, uh, pose estimation in space robotics, then you know, if they fail, they're going to cause catastrophic uh, damages to both the machines and human life. So this is not a joke because you know it really happens in real life. You know the the left the left side is you know, a Tesla Model Three crashing into a lying truck on on the highway, and the right hand side is a little bit scientific. But you know in the future it could also happen uh, if we don't if we are not careful about uh, our algorithms. So now the now now the real question is or the real topic of this talk is how do we deal with these uh, deal with these uh, occasional failures and more importantly how do we certify or verify that our algorithms do output the correct solutions? So this brings the topic of today, which is cert certifiably robust geometric perception with outliers. So I imagine in the future, these, when we deploy, deploy these algorithms, in most cases, they will succeed. And then you, know, you can just uh, relax and you know, enjoy uh, doing your own things when, when, the, when, the, when the vehicle is driving. But when the vehicle or the system is not competent, of what, it, of, what the, of the predictions or actions of the, of the autonomous system, then it'll, it'll signal these, uh, you know, these, these danger, dangerous signal, signals to the user. For example, you, know, you, you, know, you might want to grab the steering wheel to, you know, to manually uh, adjust uh, the car, or you, you, pro you possibly just want to brake you know, to take to, uh, if, the, if the conditions of the perception system is too bad. So to put things into uh, into the context of modern perception uh, pipelines. So in modern perception pipeline, usually it's consi it consists of uh, a front end, which does feature extraction and matching that outputs these uh, correspondences from 2D or 2D to 3D data uh, to, to 3D virtual measurements. And in, in these days, uh, the, usually these front ends are based on neural networks. So these front ends, uh, they, are not they, they usually do not guarantee to, uh, to give you any uh, you know, all, all correct correspondences. So usually they will fail in some cases. So what, what, what we do these days, uh, you know, uh, in our perception pipelines is that we have a robust backend that performs geometric perception. For example, we're using RANSAC, ADAPT, or GNC to, uh, to perform, uh, to estimate the 3D model from these uh, uh, correspondences that, that was actually uh, corrupted with some level of outliers. So these, uh, these uh, robust backend will give us a solution, you know, a pose of the camera or a globally uh, or, or a pose graph of the uh, of the of the mobile mobile platform.
but you know these solutions, as I said in the in the previous in in the plot of the failure rate, these solutions are usually correct, but in in rare cases, you know, it does fail. So what we propose, you know, as certifiably robust geometric perception, is that we're going to replace these uh, this block, uh, you know, of ransack or GNC or adapt with certifiably robust algorithms that not only gives you the solution but tells you when the solution is correct and when the solution is not correct. So this is, a, as I see, is a paradigm shift that you know will actually enable our robots to do perception in, in a safe way. So, and, and, the, and the last thing I wanna, I wanna emphasize, is, emphasize is that the certifiably robust algorithms we propose you know, or talk about in this, in, this, uh, in this talk is different from certifiable perception without outliers. So it differs in, you know, in, in two ways. The first thing is we explicitly consider outliers. So as you will see later, uh, we do uh, explicitly consider the outliers by using a robust cost function. And the second thing is that when you, con when you consider outliers, you will see that these problems become uh, significantly more challenging. So that when you design these certifiable robust algorithms, you will actually use more, uh, more, more advanced uh, tools from the uh, optimization uh, theory. So now I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, two examples. So the first example is, uh, is teaser, which we, uh, which, which we uh, specifically designed to do uh, point cloud registration. So what is point cloud registration? So point cloud registration as shown by these two rotating um, point clouds, given uh, two point clouds, A, I, A and B, for example, the A can be a clean a model of the bunny and then the B can be a noisy scene that consists only a partial scan of the bunny. And then we are trying to figure out the best uh, rigid transformation that can align the blue bunny to the red scene. So in this case, you know, obviously there are a lot of outlier correspondences. So we're, we're not gonna use uh, a least squares estimation, but instead we'll use what's, what's called a truncated least squares estimation framework. So this uh, cost function differs from the least squares in, uh, in the way that we have a, an, explicit, an explicit threshold for inliers that's denoted as C bar square in this equation. So this inner minimization, when you have an inlier uh, correspondence or inlier measurement, it's gonna recover the, uh, the least squares estimation uh, cost function on the right-hand side. But when you, when, you, when you have an outlier, it's just gonna assign a constant to this outlier. So as we know, when you have a constant uh, addition in the objective function of the optimization, it's not gonna affect uh, the solution of the optimization. So pictorially, what we are trying to do is to cut least square, the least squares estimation at the fixed threshold, such that you know, inner liars are, matched, are ma uh, mapped to the, uh, to the least square se uh, session and the uh, outliers are uh, mapped to the, uh, to the constant session. So this optimization, although it's known to be robust, but it's actually very challenging to solve it, you know, especially if you wanna, if you wanna uh, solve it to global optimality. So the, the strategy we use is to decouple this joint estimation into a sequence of simpler estimations. So we're gonna, we're gonna solve the scale first and then estimate the rotation. And then using the estimated rotation, we're gonna finally uh, solve the translation. So it turns out the scale and translation est estimation are relatively uh, straightforward. Uh, but what's the key, uh, the key thing or key challenge is to actually solve the rotation part uh, with, uh, with some sort of a certificate. So how, how, do we do, uh, how do we solve the rotation part? So that's, uh, that's, that's uh, you know, the crux, really the crux of teaser, which is actually to design a tight semi nephron relaxation that can solve the rotation part to global optimality. So to, in order to do this, you know, this is the, uh, the, t the truncated least squares ro rotation estimation uh, written, written in this equation. So in this case, since we have already eliminated scale and uh, translation, this is only an optimization on the, on the 3D rotations. So this, so this optimization, uh, although it's only on rotation, but it's still uh, combinatorial and non-convex. So the first thing we do is to, uh, is to write this uh, uh, TLS rotation formulation in as a standard optimization problem called the quadratically constrained quadratic program, which in, in short uh, is QCQP. So we use two uh, techniques to do this. The first technique is we rewrite the inner minimization of uh, the inlier threshold, the inlier uh, residual and the outlier constant by using this, uh, this uh, exact uh, fact that the minimization of two scalars is equal, is equivalent to the minimization 
over a binary variable that's, that we call theta. And then the second thing is we, we reparameterize re R, which is the rotation matrix uh, with the unit quaternion. That's, uh, that will give us a simpler constraint set. So, and then once we have this uh, uh, exact reformulation, this problem, however, is still non-convex because uh, this, is a, this, is, this is a QC, QP, and it's known that uh, this problem, uh, usually you don't, you don't have any hope of solving it to global optimality. So then the key, the key step is to actually lift the uh, QC, QP to a high dimensional space, uh, which is called semi-nephony uh, semi relaxation. And to perform this semi-nephony relaxation, uh, we also do it in two steps. The first step is to create a matrix variable that we call Z. That's the uh, outer product of X and X transpose. So by construction, this, uh, this matrix will be positive semi-definite. And then additionally, it will have rank equal to one. So the rank constraint is hard to deal with. So the, re the relaxation really means that we directly drop the, the rank constraint. And then we end up solving a convex semi-definite program. So this pro this, if you solve this program, you are guaranteed to find the global minimum. So now, you know, the question comes to, uh, you know, we are solving a different problem now because as shown by these arrows, this is, this is not a double, double, double ended arrow. So it's, you know, this semi program usually just gives you an approximate solution to the original non-convex problem. But the nice theorem here is if you solve the uh, SDP and then you check uh, some, some, uh, something of the, of the solution, which, which is a rank condition of the solution, then if the rank is one, then you have, you have the arrow actually flowing back. So now that you can, you can establish equivalence between the relaxed uh, SDP to the original non-convex problem. So that's really the nice property of this semi-nephron uh, uh, relaxation. And that's also why it's, we call it a certifiable perception because when you solve this SDP, you get a, prior, a posteriori uh, guarantees of global optimality. And you know, this is a, a very nice and beautiful framework. And in fact, uh, in practice, we found that uh, this relaxation is actually almost always tight, uh, even though you, even uh, when you have, for example, over 90% outliers in the measurements. But unfortunately, uh, in the current literature, uh, solving this large scale SDPs is still challenging. Although it's polynomial time and it's, it's tractable in, in theory, but in practice, we still have uh, uh, a lot of challenges in solving these large scale SDPs. So now the question uh, we want to ask is, can we uh, design some sort of certifiable uh, pipelines or algorithms without explicitly solving a large scale STP? So then we, you know, we consider, we really consider, you know, uh, those previous uh, fast heuristics that we have, we have already designed, you know, RANSAC or GNC or ADAPT. So we think that those uh, previous methods might still be valuable. So we consider this pipeline that, you know, given two point clouds, we're going to solve first solve this uh, robust estimation problem directly using a fast heuristics. For example, can be GNC or RANSAC in this case, and then you know it's going to give us a pretty good alignment. But then we we're going to we're going to ask us, can we actually do something extra to this solution such that we can we can know that the solution is correct or incorrect? So this part you know originally it was a black box that we, that we trying to design, but eventually it turns out that we, we name this part uh, certification. So what does certification do? So certification, uh, when, it, when, you, when, you, uh, when you write down the equations for certification, it boils down to solving a convex uh, semi definite program. Still, you know, you, you, we are still in the regime of STP. So, but now it's, a, it's an easier STP in the sense that we do not, find, we, we do not need to find a solution of, the, of some optimization problem, but just we just need to figure out if the intersection of some hyperplane and the PSD cone is non-empty. If the intersection is non-empty, then you know, the, the solution of GNC will be certified. So, and then to solve this problem, we're gonna use something that's, uh, that's pretty standard, which is called ordinating projections. So what does ordinating projections do? So imagine in the simplest case, you have two convex sets. In this case, just two, uh, two straight lines or two hyperplanes and then you're trying to uh, find the intersection of these two uh, convex sets. So what you do is you start from, from initial guess, a random initial guess, and then you, you first project, the, uh, project the, uh, the solution to one of the convex sets, you know, in this case, one of the straight lines, and then you project to another straight line. You keep doing this, you see this zigzagging uh, 
in between these two, uh, two straight lines. And eventually, after some, uh, some number of iterations, you will converge to the, uh, to the intersection point. So we implemented this, uh, this certification pipeline uh, uh, and together with uh, GNC as, as shown by the, by the upper uh, flow chart. So how does these uh, certification uh, perform? So we see that in this plot, I'm showing on the x-axis the inc an increasing number of outliers. And on the y-axis, I'm showing uh, you know, within 100 random runs, how many of these random runs actually uh, GNC was able to compute the global optimal solution. Uh, in this case, you know, when the rotation error is less than one degree. And on the, and the, other, two, the other two bars, the green bar and the, the, the magenta bar, means that how many of these runs were actually certified by our uh, orienting projections pipeline. So you see that if you actually do not limit the uh, number of iterations of these orienting projections, then you know, in all of the cases, the, uh, all the correct solutions were actually able to be certified. And then all the wrong solutions were actually not certified, which basically means they were rejected. And then, but if you, you know, want, want to gain some efficiency in, in the certification, then you limit the number of limit the number of iterations of the orienting projections. And then you get this uh, classical trade-off between uh, you know, performance and, uh, and, and efficiency. So you can still certify some of these correct solutions, but not all of them. But the, the, still the good thing is you never certify wrong solutions. So that's really the key of the certification pipeline. And then as we promised, you know, this certification pipeline does uh, perform really, uh, really faster than uh, solving and di directly solving STP. For example, for, uh, you know, when you have 100, 100 uh, measurements, you like if you solve the SDP, it's going to take you like, more than 1,000 seconds. But the certification, on average, it just takes a couple of seconds. So how does uh, we also perform? Uh, we also apply teaser to some real data sets. Uh, in this case, it's a 3D match data set, and then we use a, a neural network, uh, 3D SmoothNet, to output uh, key point correspondences uh, shown in the, in the in the upper video. So. The green lines are inliers and the red lines are outliers. And then you see that teaser is super robust to, uh, to, to outliers and it was able to compute the, uh, the global optimal uh, transformation. And more importantly, uh, this, the certification part rejects most of the wrong solutions as shown by in, the, in this plot. And you do, but you know, another catch, catch here or caveat here is that sometimes in some cases, the certification does certify wrong solutions. So in this case, this is the uh, this is a problem of the data because uh, you know sometimes the globally optimal solution may not be the solution that you want, or in other words, may not be the solution that's close to the to the ground truth. This happens in the case where uh, you have uh, so poor uh, estimates of the correspondences that you know no there are there are uh, uh, most of the correspondences too many of the correspondences are incorrect. In those cases. Uh, when you don't when you don't have enough inliers, uh, this this case will, will the, these kind of weird cases will happen. But we believe that with a more powerful neural network, uh, these solutions will be uh, these problems will be resolved. So next, I'm going to go to the uh, the second part of this talk, which is uh, we ask the question is you know, teaser is very successful in point power point point power restoration. Can we generalize the success of teaser? To other perception problems that you know we also have a large amount of outliers. But before I go to this uh, second talk, I want to uh, take a short break, break and ask if there are any uh, questions from uh, from from the audience. Uh, I do have a question, Hank. Um, so so I think that uh, in the previous slide you are mentioning that you know. Um, uh, this failure mode for uh, for teaser, I think the one in which you have like you know the blue dots. Um, I think like a, an important concept there is that uh, is the one of certification of estimation contracts, right? So, yeah. yes. I mean, one uh, is more of a comment than a question, but you know we have to remember that uh, if you you know you provide uh, garbage in input to an estimation algorithm, you will get garbage in output. And I think the blue dots correspond to the case in which you provide garbage to the algorithm. And I think it's worth mentioning that in the paper, you also have these kind of contracts which tell you like which kind of input data or which kind of input data is reasonable to get to get good estimates. I think that's super important. Otherwise, uh, it's not clear why this, this fails, right? 
Yes, yes, yeah. Very good comment. Yeah, estimation contracts really uh, establish when you know the uh, global optimal solution actually makes sense. Cool. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna now go to. Um, sorry, I have one more okay. question. Uh, sorry, okay. can you go back to slide ten on um, alternating projection? Yeah, here. Um, yeah, a uh, couple more clicks. Yeah, because uh, on the left, the alternating projection it sounds like um, like the, you, it it is like a general SDP solver with linear constraints. Um, so can you use this just this method just as like a general SDP solver? Or is there a specific structure for like the problem you're solving such that these methods are um, like are use or applicable or like have advantage over other types of uh, solvers? Can you provide more intuition why this is working well in this case and if there's any limitations on using this method? Okay, yeah, very good question. Very good question. Yeah, I think there are at least uh, two things that we need to uh, take care of when when using this type of ordinating projections. So the first thing is, as you said, this ordinating projection. Really, at orienting projection is a way of solving general SDPs, but actually it relies on the assumption that the projections to the to either the PSD cone or the uh, FM uh, linear linear uh, subspace is actually computationally easy. So in this case, uh, so in most cases, when you have a general SDP, the projection to the linear FM subspace is actually not trivial. So which means that you will not gain too much if you use orienting projections to solve the SDP. So in our problem, yeah, you are right. There, due to some special structure of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, binary cloning or the uh, thetas that we use of the problem, the uh, the projections to the FIM subspace can actually uh, be done in uh, in pre pretty in pretty efficiently. So the second the second uh, second thing we need to take care of is you know uh, these uh, these orienting projections act as a way to solve uh, convex feasibility problems. So, which means that you, you, you know, in order to optimize some cost, you may need to do some uh, bisection, for example, you know, because it only tells you if the if the problem is feasible or not. So you want you probably want to do fine tuning in the end, you know, you, which means you will have to call this things call this down with the multiple times uh, to solve uh, to, to, to in a, in order to actually optimize some cost function. And then later uh, in in the second part of the talk, I also show that this actually is actually uh, general in the case that when you have uh, uh, general problems with outliers, we can actually use a better method uh, to actually solve this problem. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. We can move on. Okay. Okay, so how do we generalize either? Uh, so to, to problems with uh, outliers. So Perhaps now it's it, you know now we should uh, introduce a general framework for doing a geometric perception if, if we want to generalize either to other problems. So in this formulation, again x is the uh, geometric model that we, try, we we are trying to estimate. It can be rotations or translations. The uh, the y's are actually the, the visual measurements. It can be images or images or uh, point cloud. And then the r here is a residual function that quantifies uh, the mismatch between the geometric model and the visual measurements. And then finally, rho is a cost function. For example, it can be these squares for, uh, if you don't have outliers, if you have, have outliers, you can um, use uh, truncated these squares or uh, other robust cost functions. And then, you know, inspired by the, by the success of teaser, we're gonna continue using the TLS robust cost function. So in this case, the, the previous uh, uh, optimization problem will, will be converted to this problem where now you still have uh, in, uh, an explicit thre threshold for the inlier residuals. And then now we, you know, we still use a similar technique to uh, as what we did in teaser is that we're going to convert this uh, uh, messy TLS estimation into a more uh, standard optimization problem called polynomial optimization. And then to do this step, it's actually we all we we also we we uh, we still use the technique that, that we used before, which is actually to introduce a binary variable theta for each measurement uh, y i, so such that when the theta is plus one. Uh, it means that the solution is an inlier and otherwise it's just, it's an outlier. So, and after you do this, this optimization problem will become, uh, will, will be uh, in, this, uh, in this standard form. So uh, not surprisingly, since we have a double ending arrow here, this POP is equivalently uh, hard, as, as hard as the original uh, TLS estimation. So now, you know, we, we actually have two ways to design certifiable perception algorithms. 
So in the, in the first way, we're going to relax this uh, non-convex problem into a convex problem, similarly as what we did in, uh, in the seminephine relaxation. Through this primal relaxation, uh, and so by solving this primal relaxation, we're going to get the solution. And then by checking some uh, numerical conditions of the solution, you can actually uh, obtain a certificate of global optimality. And then similarly uh, to, the t to the problem in teaser, this primal relaxation uh, will be computationally expensive because it will, it will involve solving some large scale optimization problems. And then, but on the dual side, on the dual, uh, dual point of view, we can actually, on the, uh, the other way of designing certifiable perception algorithms is, is to first, still, we solve the TLS robust estimation directly using uh, fast heuristics such as RANSAC or other uh, techniques that we designed. And then, you know, this fast heuristics will only give us a solution. And then we'll do something extra to the solution. We'll do some certification step to the solution such that we can check the global optimality of the solution. And now to put things in context, uh, you know, in teaser, the three blocks, building blocks here, in teaser, the primal relaxation is a semi relaxation. And in teaser, the fast heuristics was GNC. And then in teaser, uh, the dual certification, we used ordering projections. But for a general POP, uh, we're going to throw, throw in more powerful hammers to solve these problems. So specifically, the primal relaxation will be, we will be using a Lasier hierarchy of uh, moment relaxations, which I'll talk briefly uh, in the next slide. And then the fast heuristic, heuristics can remain the same. It can be GNC, RANSAC, or that. But then, and then the dual certification will use a more general technique called the douglas Redford uh, splitting, which I will uh, describe in, in this slide. So in this slide, I will uh, talk about the, some like very uh, high level, detail, high level uh, aspects of the primal view and dual view. So the primal view, we're trying to solve a, a generic POP, a non-convex polynomial optimization problem, in, in our case, the TLS estimation. And, you know, the global, the global optimal solution F star is, you know, hide it in a lot of uh, local minimums. So how do, we find the uh, how do we find the global minimum solution? So the Lasier hierarchy of moment relaxations, what it does is it establishes a hierarchy of convex uh, relaxations, such as at each uh, each step, which we call each uh, relaxation order, you will get an underestimator of the uh, global minimum solution. And then you hope that once you increase this relaxation order, you will get better and better uh, underestimators. So more specifically, at each level of the relaxation, we're going to solve an SDP, and then we're going to compute the solution. Uh, and from the solution, we're going to check uh, the duality gap, which actually the duality gap uh, tells you how far uh, the underestimator uh, is away from the, uh, the global minimum solution. And then the relaxation will be tight when the duality gap is, is zero. But you know, the problem of this is a larger uh, relaxation order will lead to a larger STP and eventually it will be computationally intractable to solve them. So on the dual side of view, we ask the problem that given a solution ret uh, returned by, uh, by, the, uh, by, by the fast heuristics, which we call P hat, is p hat really the global minimum? Then you know this is equivalent to asking that is p hat less than the uh, objective function for any p. So this this you know this uh, boils down to checking the non-negativity of a polynomial uh, optimization, you know which is also intractable. But then we ask a simpler question or a, a tractable problem, you know can this op can this polynomial uh, be written as a sum of squares? You know in high school you, we know that you know, once you can, you can complete the squares of some, uh, some, you know, second, degree, second order uh, polynomials, then, you know, you, you are confident to say that, you know, this is a global, global optimal solution. And then we're going to use something that's, uh, that's called ordering reflections. So this checking the condition of sum of squares is also equivalent to solving a, a, a semi-definite uh, feasibility problem, but we're going to use something called ordering reflections that that's going to be faster. So the intuition is, uh, you know, is really in this simple image. So, you know, the, the cyan ones are the ordinating, uh, ordinating uh, uh, projections, which, you know, can be slow uh, in terms of convergence. But if you, if you are being more aggressive, you know, you take each of these uh, uh, straight lines uh, to be mirrors. And then at each step, instead of doing ordinating uh, projection, you do ordinating reflections. Then you see that in, a, in just a couple of steps, you know, I was able to actually uh, 
be very close to the intersection point. So this is really the uh, the intuition behind alternating reflections. And then you know the 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 good thing about learning reflection is that you know each iteration is cheap, and then also every iteration tells you a suboptimal gap of the uh, F FP hat to the uh, global minimum solution, and then of course the solution is optimal when the gap is actually zero. So this creates the you know the uh, the primal and dual view of designing uh, certifiable perception algorithms. And now I'm going to show some uh, results of uh, of both of them. So in primal relaxation. We're gonna. Uh, what what we care about is two things. So the first thing is is the is the solution of the relaxation uh, accurate? And the, and the next thing is the second thing is is the uh, relaxation types, which basically means uh, how small is the uh, relative duality gap. So in here I'm plotting uh, the uh, the rotation arrow and the relative duality gap with respect to increasing outlier rates for a simple problem uh, that's called single rotation averaging, and you see that. The rotation arrow, which is the blue uh, box plots, are very pretty small. It's usually uh, be, uh, below one degrees. And then more, more importantly, on, on the right axis, you see that the relative duality gap are almost zero. It's, it's like a 10 to the power of minus seven, which is neg negligible when, you, uh, when considering a global optimality. And then for more compli complicated problems, such as shape alignment and mesh registration, the same, uh, same results carry over to these uh, more complex problems. So you know the rotation arrow uh, very accurate, and then the relative duality gap uh, very small, and then we do we do see that sometimes there are there are cases where you know the relaxation is not exactly tight, uh, showing by this uh, outlier in the in the box plot that you know the rotation the duality gap is actually non-zero uh, point zero something, but then you know you see that the rotation arrow is still uh, is still very small. So the takeaway here is, you know, this Lassier hierarchy is really powerful. It's tight at the minimum relaxation order. And then, uh, how do we? Then how does the uh, dual certification work? Uh, you know, perform in in, in this case, uh, in these three problems. So here I'm showing a similar plot as what we showed in teaser. So here I'm plotting the number of successful runs and the number of certified runs with respect to increasing outlier rates and the. Uh, the, the, all the runs are performed uh, using GNC, and you see that uh, uh, the, the dual certification was able to certify all correct solutions and reject all uh, wrong solutions. And similarly, we have, uh, we, have, we have similar results for shape alignment and mesh registration. And then uh, more interestingly, I'm gonna show now the suboptimality gap returned by the alternating, alternating reflections at each iteration. So you see that for the, for the correct solutions, uh, the dual certification was able to drive the sub sub-optimality down to almost zero in just uh, uh, less than uh, you know 1,000 iterations, or sometimes even less than 100 iterations. But for those uh, incorrect solutions, you know it actually the sub gap actually saturates uh, pretty quickly, and it will it will stop at uh, for example more than 10% uh, sub gap, which which will which will tell you that the solution is actually incorrect. And similarly, we have uh, results, uh, uh, results for uh, shape alignment and mesh restoration. And lastly, uh, I want to show that uh, you know, the dual certification is really uh, scalable. So here I'm showing a table of uh, results where n is the number of measurements uh, in, in those uh, applications. Uh, and then the, uh, the m is the dimension of the SDP. And then the uh, t relax is the time that's needed to solve the uh, SDP to solve the STP directly. And then the T certify is a time that, that's used uh, to perform dual certification. And then SRA, SA, PCR, and MR are just shorthands for uh, uh, four different applications. And then uh, the, two, the double, uh, double star means that the, the STP solver runs out of memory. So you see that, you know, for example, in, when N is equal to 20, which is small scale problem, we, we were still able to solve, directly solve the primal STP but then, you know, compared to certification, the uh, solving the primal SDP is way slower than doing uh, than doing certification. And then, more importantly, when 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 the when the size of the measurements grows, uh, the SD, uh, solving the SDP becomes uh, becomes more tractable, becomes intractable. Uh, it takes like a few hours or even sometimes you know a day to solve that. And then, uh, doing the dual certification is still reasonably fast uh, in 
you know, in a couple of seconds or in a couple of uh, minutes. So, and then uh, lastly, I want to show uh, an example of, uh, of, of doing, uh, of designing certifiable algorithms for uh, a safety critical application called the satellite pose, satellite pose estimation. Uh, we can see that uh, on the left hand side, I'm showing a solution that's correct and it's also being certified. And on the, right, on the right hand side, I'm showing a solution that's incorrect and it's not certified. So in summary, uh, in this talk, I, I, I propose, I uh, present three key ingredients for uh, designing certifiable perception algorithms. So the first ingredient is that you need to design a tight uh, convex relaxation. And in our case, this is let's see hierarchy plus basis reduction that I, which I didn't talk about, but it's a technique that will reduce the size of the uh, SDPs. And then the second key, key ingredient is that in order to uh, solve the uh, robust estimation reliably and in a fast fashion, you need to have fast heuristics such as graduate non convexity or DAP or RANSAC that can output a solution, uh, a global optimal solution with high probability, probability of success. And then the last ingredient is a scalable or dual certifier that can certify the solution returned by these fast heuristics. So with that, I want to conclude my talk and I also point you to, uh, to two papers that, that, that are actually, uh, one is teaser and the other one is the, uh, the, the, the general uh, uh, certifiable perception with outliers. Both of them are available on archive and uh, for people who are interested in the technical details. With that, I want to thank you and uh, uh, ask for any questions. Thank you so much for the presentation, Hank. Was uh, was uh, was quite deep. I, I do have like you know a bunch of questions on my side. Let's see if uh, first there is somebody else like asking questions. Otherwise, I will uh, probably start breaking the ice. Okay. So let me start on my side. The first thing is uh, you you started the presentation with these. Uh, uh, observation that we have no minimal solvers for the case without outliers and uh, and the key to this work is to generalize essentially like you know that kind of no minimal solvers to deal with outliers right that's essentially the, the key to the work yes uh, the question I have is uh, is, is, it, is it a strict strict generalization in the sense that uh, from the solvers that you have and the relaxations that you have is it trivial to get uh, global solvers for problem without outliers? For example, if you fix all the thetas to be one, do you get for free also solvers without outliers? Yes, uh, th that's, a, that's a very good point. Yeah, I think the answer is yes, definitely yes. If you, uh, yeah, for the, 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 the general, you know, the general uh, framework that we propose in this paper, yeah, you get, uh, you get nominal solvers for uh, outlier free case in, in free, really, uh, you, and in the more importantly, yeah, uh, for the outlier free case, you know, the the uh, the SDP relaxations will have fixed size, uh, no matter how many points you have. So that's really a, a good thing for uh, for the case without outliers. So that's why uh, uh, I stated in the in the very beginning that you know our, what, our, what 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 we are doing is significantly different uh, different or more challenging than uh, than the case with outlier without outliers because we're dealing with very, very large scale SCPs. And then they grow, they really grow with the, uh, when you have more and more, more and more uh, measurements. But uh, this thing is like, you, you step further and then you, you can easily step back. So this kind of uh, general framework uh, can also apply to any type of uh, non-minimal solvers. I and see, that. I completely agree with the analysis. I'm wondering if uh, that's uh, only true because of our choice of TLS for which is easy like to, to essentially you, you split the decision of a liar and outliers with the decision of the variable. So do you think it's something specific to a TLS or do you think that for any robust cost function, uh, you can do the same here? I, I, I know it's, it's like, you know, it's a tough question, right? But uh, I think, uh, I think in order to, uh, yeah, we can, we can use grad, we can use uh, the black uh, rank garage in duality to actually, uh, to actually, you know, decouple the uh, any robust cost function into into uh, you know thetas and the functional theta, but then the, the the thing that we need to consider is you know the the outlier process that we that's on thetas, they may not necessarily be a polynomial, so that will be the problem. If you know if it, if it turns out to be an you know an exponential function of of theta, then uh, we can't really do much uh, you know under the framework of uh, polynomial optimization. But it's, it, I think it will be possible that uh, 
you know, by uh, probably in other, uh, in the language of other optimization problems, it probably will be uh, solvable, but uh, we, I haven't explored that. It's a great answer. Okay, thanks. I, I do have a final, uh, uh, one last question, at least one last urgent question that uh, I have in my mind. So, um, for a lot of what you're seeing, like, you know, you're, you're focusing on the geometric perception side of things. And uh, what is really enabling you to focus on the geometric perception is that you're decoupling what's happening on the sensor data side by using feature detection and matching, right? So that's what is really allowing you to focus on the geometric perception side. And um, my question is, do you think that's needed? <laughs> <laughs> and do you think like, you know, you, you can design something that is certified and gets around like, you know, feature detection altogether? Do you think that uh, some of the insights you have can improve maybe feature detection? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very, uh, very cool question. I think that there, there are a couple of aspects. I think, uh, I think, yeah, if, uh, you know, at, at, on one hand, you, these kind of optimization uh, or relaxation techniques, they do apply to cases where you know where you do not have any correspondences. For example, not by us, but you know, for example, by the by the graphics community, they were able to design relaxations uh, for uh, point cloud registration without any correspondence. You know, so the correspondence the correspondence problem or the data association problem is actually uh, a problem of finding a permutation matrix. So you can also do something similar. You know, by relaxing the permutation matrix is to uh, to semi-definite programs. So that's that's on that's you know on one one side of the of of this of this question. And I but I think you know they if you do a relaxation on that problem, you do uh, get uh, more complicated relaxations and uh, probably uh, more challenging to solve. But then on the other hand side, uh, uh, I think you know certifiable perception as shown by uh, by this. I think this. Yeah, this this uh, this slide. You know, this in here we are showing. You know, uh, you know, if you think about this as an, uh, you know, in the below the picture as an end-to-end -end, uh, uh, deep learning framework, then you know we are actually what we are doing is we are establishing a certifiable uh, forward pass. So you know, then the question is, you know, these arrows can actually be flipped, right? The arrows can be can be can go from the solution to the back end and then to the front end, which, you know, those arrows will be the gradients. So if you can enable uh, differentiating through these backends, then, you know, the, the knowledge that you get from the robust backend will hopefully propagate back to the front end such that you can learn better and better uh, feature, feature, feature detections. And eventually, you know, if, you know, eventually, you know, uh, in the ideal case, if the front end is so good that, you know, it always outputs all correct correspondences, or just a couple of wrong uh, wrong solutions, then you know a backend that's like Ransack or even just outlier free nominal solvers will be able to do uh, to complete the complete the story, right? You're you'll be done uh, because you know the feature detection is so good uh, because of the robust backend. So I think there are really uh, opportunities for uh, certifiable perception uh, algorithms to to actually uh, uh, help the the feature detection and you know lab. Well, the last side note is that, uh, yeah, these uh, these feature detection uh, extraction, feature detection pipe front ends these days they really are are not that perfect. So they really give you so many outliers that you you need some uh, some robust backend, a super robust backend, that and also uh, a certifiable uh, robust backend. Great answer. Okay, thanks. Let's see if we have somebody uh, some other uh, questions. Random questions, maybe curiosities, anything? <laughs> and I think uh, probably I want to add to the, the previous question on, uh, by C. Yes, I think uh, the actually, actually in the, in the Douglas, uh, in the, you know, in the general case of uh, when we do Douglas rational splitting, actually the projection to the linear, to the linear, uh, to the affine subspace is not that trivial, but uh, still, uh, yeah, we found that uh, if you do first order, uh, first order uh, dual certification, 
is still going to be much faster than solving the primal, primal relaxation. And the other thing that I forgot to mention is that, uh, so these first order algorithms, they are good in terms of, you know, in terms of driving, you know, if you look at this plot, they are good in terms of driving the sub sub penalty from, for example, 100% to 1% or to 0.1%, but they will struggle in pushing the sub penalty from zero, from, from, from zero one, uh, 0.1% to, for example, one E minus six. So those are the long tail problems that will typically happen if you were trying to solve the STB directly using first order methods. So that, you know, if you are, you know, and the final, the slow convergence in the end will actually uh, hurt your solution because although those final, final tails, uh, long, long uh, end tails are actually just from sub penalty or relative duality gap from 0.1 to uh, 1 e minus six, the solution will actually change a lot, which means that you will not be able to get a very accurate solution if you use uh, first order solvers to solve STPs uh, directly. That's actually what we tried in the very beginning. We used uh, solvers like uh, CDCS or SDPNAL plus, which are uh, first order algorithms designed by, uh, by, some, uh, by some special, uh, by some people doing optimization. And then we found that they were actually not com uh, competitive to MOSAC, you know, these interior point methods. But then, you know, the paradigm shift from primary relaxation to dual certification is that the, usually the fast heuristics, they will already give you a very accurate solution. You know, the, actually indeed the global optimal solution if you will resolve the STB relaxation. But then you just need to, you know, care about the sub, -sub affinity gap. And as we show in this, uh, in this, uh, in this convergence plot, the sub penalty uh, between a correct solution and the wrong solution is actually huge. You know, the wrong solution will give you a sub penalty above 10%, and then the correct solutions will give you a sub penalty that's way below uh, 1%. So, in other words, you know, you do not need to drive the sub penalty, sub penalty gap to you know, 1e minus 6. It's, in, it's sufficient to just drive it down to 1%. So, which means, you know, these type of early stopping uh, will not hurt your uh, certification step. So I, I talked, you know, I talked a lot. I don't, I don't know if this makes sense to, uh, to people who, uh, who don't do uh, uh, certification, but I think you know, the short message is uh, in dual certification, we are not very sensitive to the long tail convergence of uh, first order methods. And on top of that, I, I would add that, uh, um, so the message that heuristics are accurate, I think is, uh, is a bit more complicated than that. I, I would say that, you know, a better statement that is that, uh, Heuristics are accurate till 60%, 50% outliers. After that, you have to be careful. So, yeah. so something that, that is worth mentioning is that teaser to get to 99% has to do a little bit more of, uh, you know, more than uh, graduate and non-convexity, right? So yeah. very cool. Okay. So unless there are more questions, I would uh, close it here. Thank you, Hank, for the, for the nice presentation and for the, for the discussion here. And... Uh, See you at the next meeting.